Spirit come.
invite everyone, if you have room, to move to the, the sides of the pews to make room for, our, for people who are still coming in. So we're going to sort of condense in. Thank you. There is seating at the front of the church, I know. <laughs> the very front you has spots. Our service continues on the bottom of page 13 in our worship bulletin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Creator, we give you thanks for all you are and all you bring to us for our visit within your creation. In Jesus, you place the gospel in the center of this sacred circle through which all of creation is related. You show us the way to live a generous and compassionate life. Give us your strength to live together with respect and commitment as we grow in your spirit, for you are God, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God of unsearchable wisdom and infinite mercy, you chose a captive warrior, David Okerhater, to be your servant and sent him to be a missionary to his own people and to exercise the office of a deacon among them. Liberate us who commemorate him today from bondage to self and empower us for service to you and to the neighbors you have given us. Through Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Isaiah. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him. But I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people and give heed to me, my nations. For a teaching will go out from me, and my justice for a light to the peoples. And I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out, and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me, and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever, and my deliverance will never be ended. The word of the Lord. Let us say responsively by whole verse, Psalm 138. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down before your holy temple and praise For you have glorified your name and your word above all things. All the kings of the earth will praise you, O Lord, when they have heard the words of your mouth. Though the Lord be high, he cares for the lowly. He perceives the haughty from afar. The Lord will make good his purpose for me. O oh Lord, your love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. A reading from the Epistle to the Romans. So then, my sacred family members, because Creator has shown us such mercy and kindness, I now call on you to offer your whole beings, heart, mind, and strength, to the Great Spirit as a living sacrifice. Do this in a sacred and spiritual manner that will make his heart glad. Do not permit the ways of this world to mold and shape you. Instead, 
Let Creator change you from the inside out in the way the caterpillar becomes a butterfly. He will do this by giving you a new way of thinking, seeing, and walking. Then you will know for sure what the Great Spirit wants for you, things that are good, that make the heart glad, and that help you walk the path of becoming a mature and true human being. Because Creator in His great kindness has made me a message bearer, I give this message to each of you. Do not think too highly of yourself. Instead, understand that the Great Spirit calls us to different purposes and answers to our trust in Him. For just as our bodies have many members, and each member has a different purpose, it is the same way with the body of the Chosen One. We are members of His body, and each member belongs to all the others. Creator's gift of great kindness has been poured out onto us in many ways, giving us different kinds of gifts. If your gift is to speak the heart and mind of the Great Spirit in a prophecy, then let trust guide your words. If your gift is helping others, then give yourself to help others. If teaching is your gift, teach well. If your gift is to speak courage and strengthen the hearts of others, then speak bravely. The one whose gift is giving should not hold back. If your gift is leading, lead with honor. And the one whose gift is showing mercy and kindness to others should do so freely with a glad heart. The word of the Lord. him. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, 
and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose the earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. What a joy it is to be here today, to see this full church, and to stand here representing my people who are in Montana, the southernmost part of the Blackfeet Confederacy, known in Canada as Blackfoot. I went to school because the nation paid my way, and today as an adult, I try to honor the legacy that all of us indigenous people have, which is to give back. My given name in the Blackfeet ceremony is Eagle Woman. It's pronounced Pitaki in Blackfeet. That's a name that carries a lot of responsibility. So as a priest, my professional work is in the field of indigenous theological education. I work with native people and with seminaries, with tribal people, with churches, cathedrals across the country to design new programs for indigenous people to go to seminary and learn and be welcomed to bring their traditions with them not to have to leave them at the door and choose one or the other. I grew up a Christian. My grandmother, Blackfeet, was a Methodist. So I always knew Jesus. And my father came from Copenhagen, Denmark, as an immigrant to this country, learning English by going to school in this country. And he didn't teach us Danish because he wanted us to be Americans. So my grandmother did not speak English, she spoke Danish. My native grandmother did not teach my mother her language because she didn't want her to be punished in school for using a strange language. The buffalo were gone from my land by 1870 and my grandmother moved the family to South Texas, seven miles from Mexico. And that's where I grew up. And guess what? My mother and my grandmother both learned to speak Spanish fluently, <laughs> and everybody thought they were Mexican. <laughs> because they were brown, and they spoke Spanish well. So I was part of, I, I have the legacy of coming from the skipped generation when the parents did not teach their children the language. So I'm happy to speak with you today. I wish I could do it in Blackfeet. I do preach and I do celebrate Eucharist on Thursday in Spanish. So there's a little bit of both, but I never learned Danish. So welcome to all of you, whatever language you speak. 
And I want to share in native tradition and also by invitation of some of the leaders in this church, I'm going to share a story with you. This is an outrageous story of God's love. It's an outrageous miracle story of what happened in a closed church in Riverside, California. It's where I serve. And I offer it to you this morning because I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is real. Native people know the Spirit is real. You know, we're in touch with the Spirit all the time, and for us, the Spirit is in everything. You know, my, the tradition of my people is we have something called buffalo rocks. And those are rocks that you can find out on the reservation. And those are the rocks that the buffalo hunters looked to to get messages for where the buffalo were and where they could go to find them. So talking rocks, okay with me. <laughs> Part of my heritage. When I was ordained a priest in 2012 as a grandmother, soon to be a great-grandmother, my bishop called me into his office and said, you're going to St. Michael's Riverside. You will have no congregation, and you may not start one. I've closed it down because there was too much fighting going on among the people. You will have no money from the diocese because we don't really have any for this particular kind of ministry to give you, and you will have no salary. But because you're a professor and you have a job, I know you'll be okay financially. Plus, I'm married. But having just gone through four years of seminary as a fully employed person, it was a bit of a jolt, especially since I was being sent to a beautiful three-acre campus with a church that holds about 300 people. And that year, there was no Easter in that church. However, there was Ash Wednesday, except that I had to do it on Thursday because another church rented the church that day. I said to my bishop, what do you want me to do out there? Because it's about 50 miles from my home. And he said, get in your car, drive out to Riverside, and you and the Holy Spirit figure it out. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did. Not by myself, but with dreams, with people around to help, with a benefit of liberation theology, which is what I depend upon a lot. I went to Riverside, California. I inherited three people from the former group, Maria, the secretary, Wes, the gardener, and Wade, the jack of all trades who helped do maintenance and anything else we needed. I had a dream that I should go to the park and invite the people to come to my church and have a dinner in the church with the people from the park who had no home. And that's exactly what I did. You know, we, we, we Native people, as, as many of the people of the Bible, we listen to dreams. We listen to messages that come from Creator to us in ways that for us are very natural, but maybe new to some people. So in my dream, it was like, get the people into the church and feed them. That worked because the way we get to know one another and the way you would get to know us is very easy. To sit together and eat and share stories. We share our stories, we build trust. We eat together, that's very religious. We share our traditions, our food, and so on. So I took myself over to the park, big city park across the street, another city park three blocks down, and I started inviting people to come the next Thursday for, for a dinner in the church. 35 people, mostly men, showed up. They did not have homes. 
They did not have any reliable way of feeding themselves. Some were just out of work. They couldn't find work. Others were recovering from various kinds of illnesses or substance abuses, but they came. And we put the tables all the way down the side of the wall. And on the other side, you could see outside, it was French windows. And we had dinner together. And I, 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 I opened by saying to them, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm a professor. I thought I was gonna be in a church doing sermons and hearing prayers, but I'm here in this closed church but you're with me and I think together we can do some things in this neighborhood that will count. And so one man stuck his hand up when I asked, do you have any ideas of anything that we could do together that might make a difference? And he said, sister, if you could just give us a place to have coffee and not be run off, you would change our lives more than you know. Because when we go into McDonald's or someplace, to have coffee, people ask us to leave. I said, my gosh, we can do that. You know, coffee, I'm doing the math in my head, that's not very expensive. We can do coffee. <laughs> and, and then we talked more about things they needed. Here's why I include this in the story. I thought they would ask for housing. They did not ask for housing. They asked for ways to be in relationship. Very indigenous. Not restricted to indigenous because we all need relationship. We need love. We need people who listen and who care. One man told me that he didn't really care if he had a house. What he did care was that he had friends. And so that was a clue to which way our ministry was going to evolve. And then toward the end of the night, we decided we would meet the next week. And so he, I said, let me say a closing prayer. And another man stood up, a tall, thin man. In my head, this man will always be Jesus. Because I never saw him before and I never saw him after. But he stood up and he said, sister, is this all we're doing today? And I said, well, what did I forget? You know, I, I'm new at this. I don't really know. And so what did I forget? He said to me, it's been so long since I've had communion. It still gives me the hairs to stand up on my arms. And I said to him, I can go and get the, the bread and the wine and we'll have communion right now, tonight. And we did. But again, being a new priest, I knew that the people I was going to serve would have probably some issues with alcohol. There would be some in 12-step programs. So I got non-alcoholic wine, one half of 1%, and I served it in the chalice. And afterwards, a man came up to me and he said, sister, you can't give us real wine. It's a trigger for us. You know, those of us who've gone to AA, we, don't, we can't handle real wine. I said, oh, but it's, see, college professor still, oh, it's non-alcoholic wine. He said, if it looks like wine and it smells like wine and it tastes like wine, for us it's wine. Don't do it again. See, this is the beauty of letting yourself relax into the spirit because I had already told them I didn't know what I was doing and I then I proved it in several different ways <laughs> but you know what the people took compassion on me because they knew my heart was in the right place and they knew that I cared enough about them to come and ask them what we could do together see in liberation theology you don't do things for people you do things with people so you don't just go and feed a bunch of people without having them be part of the plan. Well, life went on. Suffice it to say that we have, it evolved into Bible study on Wednesday and Thursday night, about seven, excuse me, 75 people coming for dinner. 
and we had people who signed up to mow the yard, do the garden, we had people sign up to take care of clothing. In other words, a ministry was evolving from the people. And then COVID came. So we had to shut everything down for several months. But we started up again with a drive-through food giveaway. People drive up, open their trunk, put food in, move it out. The miracle of this story is this. I started housing people illegally in the church. And I got a lot of code enforcement violations for doing that. It didn't make sense to have this many pews in a cold winter night and tell people, thanks, I'll pray for you in the park. So I invited them in. This did not go over well with the city. And my, my bishop, a new bishop, not the first bishop, but Bishop Taylor said, Mary, you know, eventually they're gonna call you on this and they can go back to your first offense and fine you from day one all the way to the present which could be thousands of dollars. He said, you've got to figure out how to help people with housing, but you can't, you, just, you know, try not to house them in the church. And I just said, well, I have to do it. How can I be a priest to homeless people and not share what we have? And so he said, well, go to work on figuring out a way you can do it legally. I want you to know from this ragtag bunch of people from the street, the park, a few Episcopalians who drifted in from other places just to see what the heck we were doing. We just opened an $8 million building and it's housing 90 people in a two-story, 50-unit apartment house. And it did not cost the diocese one penny or the city. The bishop allowed us to use our empty parking lot and the building takes all of that space. And then we partnered with two other agencies, one of them that had 29 years experience managing reclaimed housing like motels, rehabbed motels, and military barracks in one case. And they came in as our managers of the apartment house. And then we had another partnership with a community development partner, CDP, and they helped do all the paperwork and actually found the housing and wrote all of the things that we needed to do to vet people. So we house everyone who comes to us is low income. In fact, they're classified as very low income. Everyone who comes to us also is in one of these categories from, from home, broken homes where somebody moved down and left kids and somebody there to take care of them but no money. And then people who are struggling with various kinds of mental health issues that need case management. And then people who are in the process of, of achieving sobriety. I call us all ages and all stages. Um, and we have on the campus, as part of the proposal, we have professionals who are there every day to do case management. So the people are not just there, oh, well, you need to go and find a counselor. No, the counselor comes to them at the property. Well, it goes on. See, this is the Holy Spirit at work. So then people start coming from the apartment to get food that we give away on Thursday morning. It's organic produce, really healthy stuff that we get for free from farms and from grocery stores that have too much. And they start saying to me, Mother Mary, when do we have a church? When, when can we have church? We want church, when can we have church? In Espanol. I said, well, you know, I don't really speak Spanish too fluently. They said, well, we can help you. So now we have 8 o'clock free breakfast on Thursday morning, 8.30 Holy Eucharist in Spanish, with people from the group participating. So my LEM 
is a guy who came from the park, except that now he's a confirmed Episcopalian. He calls himself a Mexican Indian. How perfect. You know? <laughs> Moi, yeah, I get that. He, he's probably Azteca. He is indigenous from Mexico. He's confirmed Episcopalian now. The woman who runs the feeding program, the, the director, when I first met her, she was living in a garage across the street with her two grandchildren to keep them out of foster care. She now is a confirmed Episcopalian, was a delegate to convention last year, diocesan convention, and she, she runs, she, you can give Gloria a, a paper bag of a bunch of random foods, and I swear, because I have seen her do it, she'll feed 60 people from that. So, I give you this as an example of a kind of miracle. My clergy friends thought I was really whacked out by taking the position. Truthfully, it never occurred to me not to take the position because I'd only been a priest for two weeks. And I wasn't really big on telling my bishop, oh, I don't think I like that one, you know. I, can't you give me something with, you know, a couple million dollars in the budget? I love my ministry. And I am told that some of you are trying to think about maybe how we could, you know, how could I get involved with people from the street? Well, I'm a little afraid of them because I don't really know them perfectly normal, because guess what? They're afraid of you because they think you'll immediately reject them. When you let the Holy Spirit take over, amazing things will happen. Amazing things will happen. Things I wouldn't have had the guts to, ah, pardon, my throat's really dry right now. I wouldn't have had the the thought to, to ask for things that we got without asking for them. You're an urban congregation. We're an urban congregation. We formed a way of funding ourselves. Well, we have a lot of different ways of funding ourselves, but we have a funeral ministry that we formed with a Mexican-American guy who believes that poor people should be able to bury their loved ones with dignity. And remember, this was during COVID. And so he pays us $500 to use our church for as long as he needs to do a funeral. And he can do a really first class funeral for about three or $4,000. The same funeral downtown would be 15 to 17,000. So that's a place where God put us in touch with a funeral director who is uh, wanting to care for people. And so that's one of our funding sources. Our entire operating budget is about $120,000. It sounds like a lot, but it's really not a lot. In fairness to, to that, I don't want to mislead you, I still work as non-stipendiary. However, again, one of God's miracles, I was offered a job to work for the presiding bishop in indigenous theological education. So I have an income. Takes care of me, a lot it takes care of my husband. A lot of it goes to St. Michael's to take care of St. Michael's, but that's okay, that's okay. So I just wanted to bring you this message of hope. A lot of people think the Episcopal Church is going downhill. The numbers are dying. But last night, I had a perfectly lovely conversation with some people that we think that some of the creative things that are going on in the church just don't get the publicity. And in fact, there's a lot of good things going on. There's resurrection going on by relationships that don't go to the diocese as part of what's called the parochial report. Like I served Eucharist on Thursday this week before I came here to 39 people. But it, it's invisible to the church's bookkeeping because we're not a Sunday service and we don't have a traditional setup. So we don't do a parochial report. So all of our work is basically invisible. 
So think about this. If you're in the church and you want to do something creative to, to help people and to honor our creator, just assume you can do it. Because you know what? If you pray about it, the answer will come. People will come forward and do things and offer you help. I'm going to close with this because we're out of time. I was sitting at my office one day getting ready to pay the bills for the month. And the secretary came in and said, I think you're going to want to see this. It's a little white envelope addressed to St. Michael's Episcopal Ministry Center. Inside was a check for $500,000. I didn't even know the person. We didn't know the family. It was an estate. It was a bequest from somebody who had gone to that church years and years before. And they restricted the use of the money to two things. So I can't just put it in the operating budget. But these are the things that every priest prays to have this kind of money because one of the restricted uses was deferred maintenance. You know, when the chandelier doesn't quite work and the ceiling fan only works once in a while and then it throws off its blade and you're just glad it didn't hit somebody. <laughs> Those things that, yeah, you could turn it off. You don't really need it except last week was 107 in Riverside, California. The air conditioning went out in the whole church, and it was $55,000 to replace it. But we have money for that. Only for that and one thing. And then the other thing he restricted it for was for capital expenditures. So if we need to build a little something or repair a little something, we can do that. We can't buy groceries with it, can't do anything else with it. But those two things are the things that hurt budgets a lot in churches, you know, because you don't have money for deferred maintenance lots of times. So God has taken care of us. God is taking care of us, taking care of you as well. Native people know that if it's meant to happen and you get a few people together and share stories and eat, it's going to happen. It will happen. Because if it weren't a miracle, none of us would still be here. You know, we would have checked out many, many moons ago. But instead, we're still here. And that's the exciting thing. You're so blessed here in Oklahoma from what was a tragic beginning of relocating people against their will and leaving all their belongings behind now you have all of these wonderful people. And I don't know about your situation, but I've spoken in many churches. And in most churches, they could count the number of Native people they know on one hand. So my challenge to you, and I might be presumptuous in saying this, because maybe you already have this going. My challenge is get to know the people of the community. Invite our people in. Find out what you might do together. Find out the youth, you know, what can you do for the youth, for example. Everybody needs help with kids. So I want to leave you with that hopeful, hopeful thing. I want you to know if you ever come to Riverside, California, you'd be welcome at St. Michael's. You almost have to come to see if I'm telling the truth. <laughs> But I can tell you that I am. And I'm like a grandmother, you know, with a new grandbaby. You can't shut me up. But I think it's time to do that or I'm going to be in trouble here. So. <laughs> but I do want to thank you for listening and I thank you for inviting me. And anything that I can do regarding, um, you know, Episcopal Church and getting involved with indigenous people or non-indigenous who want to do projects together, please feel free to talk with me. My name is Mary Christ. Uh, if you say Merry Christmas, you almost have it. And my colleague that I work with all the time was here last year, Brad Hoff. He's a wonderful person also to work with. So God bless you. God keep you safe. God keep control of this COVID that is trying to get started. And all of us 
let's just be forgiving of the imperfections that we meet and really focus on the love. If we can do that, miracles happen. I'm telling you the truth. Amen. Amen. We believe in God, creator of our unique native languages, who gifted us this identity as a distinct people through our native tongues, so that our native spiritual leaders could relay God's love to our native people who could not understand that foreign tongue called English. We believe in Jesus Christ, our relative, who talked of us when he said, I have other sheep out there besides those I have here. We believe in Jesus Christ, who knew the pain of our native people, who were forced from their homeland and had no place to lay their head. We believe in Jesus Christ as our chief cornerstone, as we begin to build a new generation of native spiritual leaders. We believe in Jesus Christ, who does not say goodbye in any language, but says, I will come again. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the tongue of fire lighting upon our native people to witness to their people and to the world through the native song and dance. We believe in the Holy Spirit as our guide and the driving force for our native people to do a new thing as we walk a new journey toward perfection for all humankind. Amen. In thanksgiving for Mother Earth, we sustain our very life, especially during the season of bountiful harvest. Creator, in your mercy. In thanksgiving for Native Americans who live for millennia in harmony with Mother Earth, may the leaders of all countries listen to the wisdom of their Native people and work to make the drastic changes necessary in how we live on Earth. Creator, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In thanksgiving for our Native American sisters and brothers of all this region, as we remember that we live on this land, that the Proto-Wichita peoples once called home, and that now is home of 39 recognized tribes brought to Oklahoma through the Trail of Tears. Creator, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For Native Americans and First Nation peoples as they strive to bring back their languages and cultures and confront the problems of poverty and hunger on so many reservations and in so many cities and towns, Creator, in your mercy, that the Episcopal Church, Diocese of Oklahoma, and St. Paul's Episcopal Cathedral will continue to learn from indigenous peoples, continue to make amendment of life, and be instruments of peace and restorative justice for indigenous people. Creator, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. That the Church Universal may be forgiven for its colonial attitudes and destructive actions and be reconciled with indigenous peoples everywhere in respectful and mutual encounter, dialogue, and live faith in our one God, creator in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For healing and an end to systemic injustice that leave indigenous people suffering disproportionately, especially in the enactment of the doctrine of discovery and Indian boarding schools. 
Creator, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For remembrance of those who have taken their journey to our ancestors, especially Marie Whiteman, who is the niece of St. David Pendleton Okerhader. Creator, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. That our cathedral, responding with courage to the signs of our times, may embrace our role in learning with humility and leading with intention to the betterment of relationships between us and all indigenous people, respecting the dignity of all human beings. Creator, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are ill, especially our presiding bishop, Michael Curry. Creator, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Come, let us return to the Lord and say, Creator God, in our sin we have avoided your call. Our love for you is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Have mercy on us, deliver us from judgment, bind up our wounds, and revive us. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord enrich you with grace and nourish you with many blessings. The Lord defend you in trouble and keep you from all evil. The Lord accept your prayers and absolve you of your offenses. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. but just buckle in. I am so delighted to be with you all today. My name is Katie Churchwell. I'm the dean here at St. Paul's Cathedral. If you are visiting with us, we are so glad that you are here. Uh, we welcome especially those um, who are from the Whirlwind Mission in Watanga and from St. Paul's in Holdenville. We are so glad not just to have you all with us, but to have your leaders. If Deacon Pat and Deacon Cintha would please stand. I know it's embarrassing. <laughs> we are so grateful to have you with us. Thank you. And now if the Reverend Canon Mary Christ, comma, E, E, D, would please stand. Mary. Mary, we're so grateful. Thank you. Um, following this service, we will have a very brief reception in our reception area, which is the building right next door. I invite you to get a snack and to grab a cup of coffee or a drink. And then, this is going to just... It'll be okay. Bring it with you back into the cathedral. 
We do ask that you be careful and try not to spill, but we also understand that happens. It'll be fine, but grab something to eat. Enjoy the displays that are out there. Um, also, during that time, you're invited to come and see the displays that we have set up in our various worship spaces. And please um, uh, come back where we will um, be having a conversation, uh, Mary and myself, and with questions from you all as well. I cannot thank enough our musicians for being with us today. We have our beloved Caddo drummers who every single Ochre Hater Sunday are with us and um, y'all are just our family to us and so we're grateful that you're here, thank you. We also, <laughs> we also welcome today Vanita McGorman, did I say it right? All right. Uh, Vanita McGorman, who will be playing the flute, and she has, uh, looks like one, two, three, four, five, five, five um, indigenous flutes with her, and so be waiting for this gift of music that will be coming our way. If the members of our Ochre Hater Guild would please come forward and just sort of line up down here, and then if Mary and Deacons Pat and Cynthia would come over here, um, I know. And then if uh, Michael and DG Smalling would come and join me, please. Okay. This is the gift giving portion of our service. So we are so, 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 so lucky. Today we have with us um, Choctaw artist DG Smalling, um, who's standing here with, um, you just say it, A-P-N-E-X? Apex, at, at Mex, um, which is an Oklahoma City-based global precious metals retailer. Um, uh, this is Michael Steinhardt, um, beloved husband of our new communications minister, Sarah Emily Steinhardt. Uh, DG Smalling, um, as an artist, um, has some images, and what had what happened is uh, they partnered together with at Mex to create an exclusive custom coin collection. And this uh, collaboration features two iconic Oklahoma symbols, the Grand Buffalo and the Osage Warriors Shield. And so they have so kindly gifted one of these coins um, to each member of our Ochre Hater Guild and to each of our esteemed uh, guests in worship today. And so I'm gonna let you all hand those out. Those and then I have more. Okay. That might be enough. Um, so these coins are struck in copper um, and are in a protective case. And so um, please. Um, and then um, our Ochre Hater Guild friends, if you wouldn't mind gathering some for your friends who are busy doing other things with our programming today. Here's Karen and um, Janice. Janice, thank you. <laughs> In addition to these coins, um, you may have noticed that our epistle reading came from something called the First Nations Version, an indigenous translation of the New Testament. And so we have as a gift today a copy of that New Testament for each member of our Ochre Hater Guild and for our esteemed guests, as well as a Disciples Prayer Book, which comes from the indigenous ministries um, of the Episcopal Church. And so, is this right? I wrote a little note. Mary. Oh, you guys stood in order. How about that? And Pat. I'm going to lovingly hand you all this stack and let you take the one that has your name in it. And thank you. Thank you, thank you. And if it needs to be after the service, that's okay too. Okay. So lastly... 
I want to recognize three very important um, special people who are with us today. And so if Theta and Daisy would please stand. Theta and Daisy are direct descendants of David Pendleton Okerhater. And I'm so sorry, I, I have a book for you as well, but I left it in a different room and I will get that for you. But here we have a coin for you as well and, and a book of the uh, indigenous um, New Testament. And we are so grateful um, not only for the legacy that you carry forward um, from your uh, great-grandfather and your great-uncle, um, but thank you for your presence being with us today. Thank you so much. And also would like to recognize our very own mother, uh, Canon Carol Hampton, who um, is instrumental in indigenous ministries in the Diocese of Oklahoma, and in particular here at St. Paul's. And one of the things that I love and value about indigenous um, tradition is that the esteem and respect that you hold for your elders is there is nothing that exceeds that except for perhaps your love of God. And so you should know, um, Canon Carol Hampton, that you are the height of esteem um, for this congregation, and we are so grateful for everything that you have done, past, present, and still to come. And so we have a coin for you, and I also have um, a Native American New Testament for you as well that I just forgot in a separate room. <laughs> Don't take that personally, it's, I promise. Okay. Um, I am so grateful to um, all of our Ochre Hater Guild for their preparations of this day. I'm so grateful to Michael and to DG for being with us today and gifting us um, with something that will last forever <laughs> um, and be a reminder to us of the ways in which indigenous culture is um, a treasure, a treasure. I'm grateful to our guests um, and I'm grateful to John Turman and Lynn and Ernesto Sanchez who did all of our um, decorations in our cathedral. This is my most favorite Sunday, and that we get to worship together is a gift, and I thank you all for being here. Again, at the conclusion of our service, you'll go get a snack and coffee, and then you'll come back, and we'll have uh, more conversation with, with Mary. And I don't remember what the offertory sentence is, but let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving.
If our Lady Eucharistic Visitor would please come forward. Lucy, who will you be visiting today? I will be visiting the Gil, and Tim Parrish, and, uh, and... Anne Lynch, Tim Parrish, and Ralph and Mary Nell Guild. Yes. Please be sure to share with them the joy and delight of this day and encourage them to watch our live stream, which all of you could go back and rewatch again. Lucy, we send you forth bearing these holy gifts, that those to whom you go may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We who are many are one body, because we all share one bread, one cup. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus Christ, our leader, you are the son of the creator. Today we became your children. Today we became your grandchildren. We will live as you have taught us. We will follow your commandments, watch over us, speak to us from the trees, from the grass and the herbs, from the breeze, from the passing rain, from the passing thunder and the deep waters. Before us there is beauty, behind us there is beauty. Allow us to walk along life in happiness, completed in beauty. Amen. Now, to the one who can keep us from falling and set us in the presence of the divine glory, jubilant and above reproach, to the only God our Savior, be glory and majesty, might and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God.
now together. Thank you, God, for the pleasure of serving together. Amen. Okay, deacons, lead us on out. Take that book out, Tracy.